we have weeds in our mind. A lot of you spent the evening, the late part of the afternoon, weeding. When you do something like that, it's good to reflect on the lessons you learn outside and how they apply to the mind. As in the orchard, we're trying to provide a place that provides shade. We want the trees to grow well. And yet we've got weeds coming in, taking the water away from the trees, and not only that, but making life difficult for the people who stay here. Some of the weeds have burrs, some of them have thorns. And so you've got to remove them. Otherwise, the water goes to waste, and the people who live here, the ones who are living here now, the ones who are going to be living here for the rest of the year, are put to difficulties. It's the same with the mind. There are certain qualities in the mind that are like weeds. We're trying to develop good qualities in the mind. Mindfulness, alertness, concentration, discernment, and yet there are the qualities that stand in the way. You've probably heard of them. They're called the hindrances. These are the things that stand in the way of our concentration. And you can compare them to weeds of different sorts. Sensual desire is like a vine. <clears throat> There's a story in the canon about a vine that grows up around a solid tree. This maluva creeper, it's called. One of its seeds lands next to the tree, and the devas and the other trees come and talk to the deva in this tree and say, don't worry, don't worry. Maybe a fire will burn the seed, or maybe a hunt woodman will come and step on it and chop it, or a peacock will eat it. And maybe it's not even a seed, but it is a seed, and nothing happens to it. It gets watered and starts growing, and the creeper, sta creeper starts growing up the tree. And at first the deva in the tree doesn't see anything wrong with it. After all, the, the tendrils of the creeper are soft and downy. But as the creeper grows up the tree and winds around, finally strangles the tree, creates a canopy over the top of the tree and brings it, all the major limbs crashing down. And that's when the deva realized, oh, this is the future danger that they saw. That's why they came and tried to console me. Sensual desires like that, when it first comes, it seems perfectly harmless. It actually seems nice. But after all, it takes over the mind. It brings all your good qualities crashing down. That's one kind of weed you've got to take care of in the mind. And then there's ill will. This is like weeds with thorns. If you get anywhere near it, it cuts you. In other words, when you let anger overcome the mind, you're often harmed more by it than anybody else is. And it's like a thistle. The thistle has those little flowers and these tiny seeds, and they go all over the place. So that's a weed you've got to be very careful with. You have to treat it with good strong gloves on your hands. And there's sloth and torpor. It's like a weed that if you happen to eat the leaves, it puts you to sleep, knocks you unconscious. So nothing can develop in the mind at all. Or you could compare it to eucalyptus trees. Once they grow someplace, they totally destroy the soil so that nothing else can grow there. Restlessness and anxiety is like poison oak or poison ivy. You get anywhere near it and you're just covered with rashes and itches. Can't sit down in any peace or quiet anywhere.
And then finally there's uncertainty, which is like one of those weeds that if you eat it, it gets you confused. Blurs your vision, blurs your mind. So these are things you've got to get out of the mind. Some of them are obvious problems, other ones you have to have experience with them to know this is a weed and this is not a weed. We've got these burrs here in the in the grove, the plant with burrs, and unfortunately its leaves are very similar to the leaves of a California poppy. The poppies are things we like, we like. the burrs are things we don't like. And if you don't observe carefully, you might end up pulling out the poppies when you're trying to get out the other weeds. So the first thing though, is to learn how to observe these qualities in the mind. Even with the obvious ones, it's important to observe how they come. You have to watch them. You have to put the mind in a good place where it can see these things clearly. That's where we're trying to develop a place where the mind can stay. The Buddha recommends starting off with restraint of the senses. In other words, even before you sit down and close your eyes, you have to be careful about how you open your eyes, how you look, how you listen. Because you can take in all kinds of problems, bring in all kinds of seeds for weeds in your mind. And Buddha's not saying not to look, not to listen. He said you have some skill in your looking and listening. Notice how the mind goes out and look at things when it's looking for trouble and when it's actually looking for something useful. It's not the case that you can blame all your defilements on things coming in from outside. These things come from within the mind. The mind gets an itch, it restless, it's an anxiety. It gets an itch to go out and look at this, look at that, listen to this, listen to that, things that will give rise to lust, things that will give rise to anger, whatever the itch is. So you have to be careful that you don't give in to that itch. If you see yourself looking at something for the purpose of lust, well, try to look at its other side as well. If you're feeling irritated and want to find a good reason to be angry, be careful to look for the good side of whatever it is you're focused on. In other words, try to be a person with two eyes and not just one. When you can begin to read your mind while your eyes are open, it gets a lot easier to read it while their eyes are, your eyes are closed, because you're familiar with the effect that these things have on your mind. So you try to clear a little space in here where your mindfulness can grow, where your alertness can grow with the breath. Make up your mind that any other thought that comes in their mind right now is something you don't want. No matter what the thought is, treat it as a weed, something you don't want to go near. And then as you get more firmly established in the breath, then you can start watching these things. When these weeds grow, how do they grow? What's the little seed that gets them started? How do you feed the seed? How do you nourish it? Can you learn not to nourish it? What's the soil that allows these seeds to grow? You want to put yourself in a position where you can see these things clearly. That's why it's so important to get the breath as a foundation, or whatever it is in the present moment that allows you to settle in and be solidly here in the present moment. Some people find the 32 parts of the body a more riveting way of getting into the present and staying in the present. Whatever the object, the important thing is that you keep your object in mind. That's what mindfulness means, and that you're alert to what's happening. When you can watch what's happening, then you can begin to control the weeds. In other words, you don't have to wait until they've already grown before you pull them out. You begin to see the seeds. You see how you nourish the seeds. And there are two ways of dealing this, with this. One is to nourish the seeds of good qualities instead, 
and the other is to de try to deprive the seeds of the soil, the seeds of the, the weeds. So meditation is not simply a matter of sitting here and watching whatever arises. without having preferences. After all, we'd much rather have the avocado orchard here than we would have a, a place full of thistles. And it's the same with the mind. You'd much rather have good qualities inside than those other weeds that pull you down, stick into your skin. give you a rash. That's the kind of preference that you, that's really a skillful preference. When they say that the great way is easy for those with no preferences, it doesn't mean that you're not trying to develop things skillfully in the mind. It's simply that you do whatever work has to be done. That's where the issue of preferences has to be put aside. When you see that you need to do work to get the mind to settle down, you do that work. When you need to do work to fight the lust and the anger, you do that work. But you're doing it because developing skillful qualities in the mind is important. That was the big distinction that lies at the base of all the Buddha's other teachings, that lies at the base of right view. Seeing what's skillful, seeing what's not skillful. Learning to uproot what's unskillful and learning to nourish what is skillful. That kind of preference is part of the path, because it is in our power to shape the mind. You're not simply a passive observer trying to learn how to accept whatever comes up. In the beginning you may have to accept what comes up simply because you want to watch it and see what's happening. But as you begin to get a sense of what's what, which plants are the good plants that you can eat or whose shade you can use. or It'll give fruit or flowers that you want, and which are the plants that just have thorns, the plants that are poisonous. Once you can distinguish them, okay, then you can start weeding out the, the unskillful qualities and promoting the skillful ones. And you benefit, and the people around you benefit as well. So allow yourself to follow through with that preference, the preference to develop states of mind that really do give a greater sense of ease, greater sense of well-being in the present moment, and lead on to things that are even bigger, ultimately to the end of suffering. Those are the plants you want to foster. Anything that gets in the way is a weed. Do your best to uproot them, do your best to make sure that they don't take over, and that ultimately they get squeezed out by all the good plants. So the mind becomes a really good place to stay. <laughs>